Welcome to TCC family. We pray today's service inspires you to walk closer to Jesus. Whether you're on YouTube or Facebook, we encourage you to subscribe and follow our pages to stay connected. If you're on YouTube, don't forget to hit the notification bell. We're glad you're here. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God. So I'm going to speak to you about the Emmaus Road. Emmaus Road. Now I'm going to read to you the book of Luke chapter 24. Fasten your seat belts. We're going to go through some scriptures today. Amen. Praise God. Now, that same day, two of them were going to the village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. The context of this scripture is, you know, after Jesus uh, was crucified, he died. They buried him. And uh, on the third day, on the third day, these two of the disciples of Christ were headed away from Jerusalem. I want you to keep in mind that Jesus had instructed all of his followers to stay in Jerusalem. Yet these two followers were scattering. They were walking directly away from Jerusalem to a town named Emmaus, right? They were talking with each other about everything that had happened as they talked and discussed these things with each other. Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still with their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked them, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked, about Jesus of Nazareth? They replied, he was a prophet powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since this all took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but did not find his body. They came up and told us that they had seen vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found, found it just as the woman has said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken, did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on, continued on as if he was going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. So when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while well, he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. All right, so there are people, these two disciples were on the road to Jerusalem, away from the place that Jesus had commanded them to stay. And there are people on the road of life, there's a road to a so-called Emmaus, directly away from the place that God has called them. Why? Because they had a disappointment or they had a negative experience in their life. Two of the followers of Christ were talking to each other what, what had happened. They were talking about the events that had just taken place with the passion, death, and burial of the Messiah. All this must have seemed very surreal. They must have been in shock. Just a few days before, it all appeared to be so positive. Jesus had made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Sadly then, all of a sudden, he who knew no sin was made sin for all of mankind. They were expecting a great military leader to deliver them from their temporary oppression. Christ came to deliver them, to deliver not just them, but all of humanity from the permanent bondage of sin and death. They were processing the way that Christ was mistreated and killed. This was beyond their comprehension. Again, it goes back to the principle that people generally want to do away or kill that which they do not understand. See, they do not know where to place Jesus, what box to place him in. Do you know that when people don't understand you, you don't fit neatly in their boxes of their little expectation, then they want to do away with you because you make them uncomfortable, right? So you know what they did with Jesus? They could not place him in the box. They could not contain him, so they crucified him. On the road to Emmaus, they were talking and discussing all these things that had happened with each other. They were trying to make sense of it all. The more they talked about it, the less sense it made to them. There was no rational explanation. How could someone who had committed no crime suffer the fate of, 
worse of criminals, the full weight of the Roman law came down on Christ. There was, this was simply too much to digest. I guess most of us human use speech and communication with one another as a way to try to process tragic events. There is a modern term in psychology called talking therapy. Say with me, talking therapy. This is real, by the way. See, talking therapies involve talking to someone who is trained to help you deal with your negative feelings. They can help anyone who is experiencing distress. You don't have to be told by a doctor that you have a mental problem to be offered a benefit from talking therapy. Talking therapists give people the chance to explore their thoughts and feelings and the, and the effect that they have on their behavior and mood. Describing what's going on in your head and how it makes you feel can help you notice any patterns which may help be helpful to change. It can help you to work out where your negative feelings and ideas come from and why they're there. Understanding all this can help people make positive changes by thinking and acting differently, right? So if we look at this passage of scripture, the two followers of Jesus on the road to Emmaus, uh, they were actually having a talking therapy session of sorts, I guess. They had negative feelings about the whole situation. In essence, they were absorbed in the events of a few days earlier, they talked to each other. They were validating their feelings and their fears. I guess the most tragic thing about them was that they came, became instantly fixated on recent past events. They were going somewhere called Emmaus. Each time an event takes place, different people view it through their own lens of past experiences. There are details that can be, that can be missed by an individual, but and that one may fail to recall. We usually do this after a great church service, right? And we get together and we say, didn't God move? Well, this is what God did. Did you see what God did? Well, this is what I felt. This is what God showed me, right? So as a pastor, I'm often amazed about how God during our services does so many different things at different levels. Once I, I get together with staff and others, then I can get a more three-dimensional view of what has taken place. The same goes for any unusual event that takes place in our individual lives. The more traumatic the event, the more we need to verbalize or talk about it. This allows the person to make sense and deal with any issues at hand in a healthy manner. Notice that putting into words the feelings that we have can help us to organize and compartmentalize. The Bible says that these two followers of Jesus were on the journey away from Jerusalem to a place called Emmaus. It was about a seven mile long journey. We don't know the reason why they were headed there specifically other than they were dispersing. The Bible says in Zechariah chapter 13, Awake sword against my shepherd, against the man who is close to me, declares the Lord Almighty. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered, and I will turn my hand against the little ones. Matthew chapter 26 says, Then Jesus told them, This very night you will fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. The road to Emmaus was the road, away, the road away from the place of the promise. It was the road of bereavement. It was the road of disappointment. It is the road of unbelief. It is the road of regrets. The, fo the followers of Jesus were told by him well in advance about the events, the events that were going to take place or what was going to happen. Yet it appeared that it took them by surprise. Jesus had warned him, he had told them, yet to them it was a shock and he seemed as he was surprised because they were hearing him, but they were not really listening. The Bible says in Matthew 13, this is why I speak to them in parables, though seeing they do not see, though hearing they do not hear or, or, or understand. Jesus had clearly communicated to his followers about his passion, death, and resurrection. We find evidence of this in Matthew chapter 17, verse 22. When they came together in Galilee, he said to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and on the third day he will be raised to life. And the disciples were filled with grief. When Jesus shared with his disciples about his death and resurrection, the disciples only heard that they were going to kill him. They were not listening to the entirety of the message, the part that he's going to be raised again, right? He was telling them that he was going to be killed, but then on the third day he will be raised. The Bible's the disciples were filled with grief. The only thing that registered with them was that Jesus was going to die. After all the signs, wonders, and miracles that he did in front of them, including the raising of the dead, they could not process the fact that he was going to be raised from the dead. Matthew chapter 27, verse 32. As they were going out, they met 
a man from Cyrene named Simon. They forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place named Gol called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mix with gold, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against, against him. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one to his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. And from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling to Elijah. Immediately, one of them rang and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn from the top to the bottom. The earth shook and the rock split. So when the actual events happened, which totally shocked all of the disciples, including his followers, they all scattered. The Bible says in John chapter 19, near the cross of Jesus, stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciples whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her into his home. Near the cross, his mother stood and a few other ladies. Everyone else ran off and left Jesus in his darkest hour. The only disciple that stood by him was John. After Jesus said, it is finished, he was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Let me prove it to you by scripture. In Mark chapter 15, verse 43, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked him for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he, have, that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had was already died. When he learned from the centurion that he was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph brought some linen cloth, took the body down and wrapped it in linen and placed it in the tomb cut out of the rock. Then he rolled a stone against, him, against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, a mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. See, the matter appeared to be terminal. The fate of Jesus, according to all, was sealed for the next three days. All here on earth appeared to be going on as usual, but as the body of Christ laid in that tomb, there was some major shaking going on in the spiritual realm. The spiritual realm was shaken to its core. Everything changed when Christ, the perfect Lamb of God, gave his life. According to the Bible, according to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7, but to each of you, to each one of us, a grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why scripture says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He, was who, who, he who, dis, who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It is believed that Jesus descended to Abraham's bosom. We find reference of this in Luke chapter 16. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, he was where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham 
replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you receive your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he's comforted here and you're in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, there's a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to there cannot, nor anyone cross from over there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not come also to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, But if someone came from the dead and goes to them, they will repent. He said to him that if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. It is believed that Jesus proclaimed the mystery of the gospel to those who died prior to the sacrifice of Jesus. Some believe that he was to those who died during the Noah's flood, and others believe that he was to all of humanity. I quote you out of the book of 1 Peter chapter 3. For Christ also suffered once for his sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but was made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago, and when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this is the water symbolized as baptism that now saves you, not just the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels' authority and powers in submission to him. All here on earth appear to be settled and going on as usual during the first three days after his death. Death appeared to be the final blow, but all were in for a great surprise. So on the third day, after Jesus took captivity captive, after accomplishing his mission in the supernatural realm, his sinless body could not and did not see decay. Bacteria could not even get close to his body. Flies and other insects could not and would not dare approach the sinless body of Christ because he knew no sin decay had no power or authority over him according to acts chapter 13 now when david had served god's purpose in his own generation he fell asleep he was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed but the one whom god raised from the dead did not see decay on the third day jesus rose from the grave his perfect sinless body body had now scars in his hands and feet there was also a great wound on his side what we consider imperfection and unsightly became the very sign of our perfection and beauty. His wounds are for our healing, his chastisement for our peace. The follower, followers of Christ on the road to Emmaus had no clue that all these things had taken place from the moment that Jesus gave up his spirit. On the road to Emmaus, the followers of Christ were walking and talking as if it was all over. They did not know what to do next. They were on the road of despair and disappointment. How many of us have ever walked down the road of disappointment in our lives? I, I dare think say that all of us in this place have experienced this. How many of us have ever found ourselves walking with someone who shares similar bitter life experiences? It is said that misery loves company. The road to Emmaus is the road of helplessness and hopelessness. It is a road that is filled with regrets of what should have been, could have been, and never was. This road where we tend to live in the past. This is the road where we tend to think that if we we talk about it long enough that we'll somehow we can fix it, but we can't. How many people are walking on their personal road to Emmaus? It is tragic that even though Jesus had already resurrected to these two disciples in particular, he was still dead. How tragic that even though they knew about the woman who had gone to the tomb and saw an angel, even though other disciples had been to the empty tomb, they still mourned as if he was still dead. How tragic it is for these men that even though Jesus had already told them in advance that on the third day he was going to resurrect, he was still dead to them. I can think of a young lady in, when I was a young man, I was a child actually in the congregation in New York City. She had three young children. She was in her 20s and, uh, and suddenly she became anemic and weak. She was diagnosed with terminal colon cancer that was metastatic everywhere. Her family was in disbelief. The congregation, she went on eventually to be with the Lord. And the congregation and her family were left with many questions. 
there was a road of trying to reconcile the events of this young woman's life. Anytime anything tragic happens in our lives, we go through a checklist of possibilities. We often rehearse in our minds that at what if we had acted differently? What if we would have been done this or that or the other? The followers of Jesus had left Jerusalem and they were headed to Emmaus. By this point, Jesus was back on earth alive and well, but they acted as if he was still in the tomb. They left the place assigned to them by Jesus. They began to move away from Jerusalem one step at a time. This is what regret and disappointment does to us. When regrets and disappointments come our way, we usually start a journey away from the place that God has assigned us to be. Is that not right? Because well, what's the use? What? See, it's like, we're trying to get back even with God. You ever been done that? Well, you may not admit it to yourself, but that's literally what you're doing. You say, well, God, you show me this, but what's the use? So therefore, I'm going to do this. I'm going to walk. How, how many have ever thrown a temper tantrum with God? I know I have. How many of us have tried to hold them hostage? I know I have. And the people who, who didn't raise their hands, maybe you could do like this. <laughs> you see... When regrets and disappointment come our way, we usually start with a journey away from the place where God has assigned us. This is because we tell ourselves that there's no use staying. The road of regret and disappointment is seldom traveled alone. There's usually a companion or someone who agrees with us. You don't have to go very far to find someone who agrees with you about how awful things are. You won't have difficulty in finding someone who will commiserate with you concerning tragic events or difficult circumstances. The road to Emmaus was about seven miles long, but it might as well have been a hundred miles long. This is the road where you, where you see what you expect to see and not what is really there. In other words, the road of Emmaus is where we have given ourselves over to a fatalistic worldview. A fatalistic worldview. Huh. What do you mean, Pastor? Everything is bad. Everything is going to pot. This is the road that says if it wasn't for bad luck, I wouldn't have any luck at all. And by the way, as Christians, we don't believe in luck. We're, we have destiny. We have purpose in God. Amen? Praise God. There's no such thing as luck. Uh-uh. There are no coincidences or accidents in God. Our lives have been carefully planned out by God just in case. Amen? The disciples had Jesus right in front of them, but they did not recognize him. The followers of Jesus were walking along this road. They were rehearsing the events of the previous days. Jesus himself came up alongside of them and began to talk with them. They did not recognize him. They did not recognize the one with whom they had spent so much time. Part of the reason they did not recognize him was because they were not expecting to see him. They were wallowing in their own misery. All that they saw was gloom, doom and gloom. He showed up because they were not expecting him, yet they totally missed him. Luke chapter 24, he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? Jesus was now in his glorified body. He knew that what they were talking about, he was trying to get them to realize who they were actually talking to. Yet they stood still with their faces downcast and replied to Jesus. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? In other words, where have you been? You must be some kind of a foreigner that... You don't even know what has shaken the whole city of Jerusalem. Jesus asked them what things. In other words, spill it out. Let it out. Express yourself, right? So they went on to inform Jesus in Luke 24, amen, about Jesus of Nazareth, that he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. And they went on to to tell him about he was crucified, right? And in addition, have the report of the women who had said that he was that they had seen vision of angels saying that he was alive, and some of the disciples who had been to the empty tomb and found it just as the woman had described. Cleopas was telling Jesus about his own death and the reports of his resurrection, yet he did not have a clue who he was talking to. He was telling Jesus that the angels had said that he was alive. Then Jesus continued his conversation with them. He did not throw a temper tantrum because they did not recognize him. Instead, he went along and told them in Luke 24, verse 25, he said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. 
Jesus reminded them of what he himself has spoken, what all the scriptures said about him. The road to Emmaus is the road of disappointment. It is the road of regrets. regrets. It is the road of reflection and questioning. Jesus explained the scriptures to them. Let me tell you, all visions and all revelations must line up with the word of God. Anyone who claims to have a vision or revelation that does not line up with the word of God is in error. Even Jesus in his glorified body, out of all the possible things that he could have done, he chose to walk seven miles with two of his followers. He chose to walk, he chose to walk with them and hear the hearts of the ones he loved. Jesus was not afraid to walk right along with us for a while on the road of disappointment. He will walk with us for a limited amount of time, but he will not leave us the same. He understands that we need to process the events, but he also shows up not to commiserate with us, but to change us and to heal us. In other words, he loves us the way we are, but he loves us too much to allow us to stay the same. Jesus could have showed himself to Pilate or to the soldiers. He could have gone to the religious establishment and brought them all to their knees, but he did not do that, no. He could have gone to Rome and appeared to Caesar and caused a revolution, but he did not do that either. He chose instead to take a seven-mile walk with the ones he walked, he, with the ones he loved. He chose to hang out with the ones that he had already made an investment into. God so honors and values relationship that he prioritized those he loved who were on the road to Emmaus, the road where two of his own were grieving. He took the time out to explain the scriptures. And I quote you out of Isaiah chapter 43. But now this is what the Lord says, he who created you, Jacob, he who formed your Israel. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt and then ransom and cushion Siva in your stead. This is the type of value that God places on the one he loves. God is a God of honor and relationship. God is agape. God is love. Love. In the New Testament, the parable of the love sheep illustrates this truth. In Luke chapter 15, verse 1, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not repent. The love of God is obstinate. The love of God is overwhelming. The love of God has no end. Jesus is not afraid of the disappointments of your life. He's not afraid or taken aback by your questions or regrets. I have a feeling that there are those under the sound of my voice who are on the road of, the, of Emmaus. What could have been and never was. The things and situations that do not add up. The things and disappointments that appear to have no solution. There are many who know Christ, yet they are walking down their personal Emmaus road. They they know him, yet they have lost sight of him. And they move out of the place where he assigned them to stay. They have forsaken their first love. They're walking down their Emmaus road as if Jesus was still on the tomb. To those who find themselves on this road today, I have good news for you. The master, the Lord of the universe has promised that he will be with you always. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 13, keep your lives safe, free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never we will I forsake you. The road to Emmaus. Amen. If you allow someone to appoint you, then you will be disappointed at some point. But when God appoints you, he will never disappoint you. The road of life is more than not an Emmaus road experience. You may not be able to see him, but he's right there with you. And let us pick up the story again in Luke 24, verse 28. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly. They urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went to stay with them. Notice what the Bible says about the, these disciples. As they got close to Emmaus, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. Jesus walked 
with them from Jerusalem to Emmaus and wanted to commune further with them, but waited to be invited to stay. Jesus will not force himself on us. He wants us to desire him and to welcome him. Amen. Near the end of their journey, the disciples thought Jesus was going to continue walking on, but they urged him strongly to stay. This urge strongly was not casual. It was not like, if you want, no, no, you got to stay. Have you ever met someone who urges you strongly? It's like, no, no, like I've been to places, you got to eat. No, no, but I'm not hungry. You got to eat. And they put the food right there and they won't take no for an answer. That's how they did. Amen. That's how we do in my house as well. Somebody comes to visit. Amen. They urged Jesus strongly to stay with them from the moment from the moment Jesus joined them on their journey, they felt something they had never felt before. They did not understand what it was, but they knew that they had to hang out with this stranger some more. They were desperate. They urged him strongly. Another translation, the New Living Translation says, by the time they were nearing Emmaus, at the, at the end of their journey, Jesus acted as if he were going on. But they begged him, stay the night with us since it's getting late. So he went home with them. The disciples begged Jesus to stay with them in their minds. They did not recognize him, but they knew that Jesus carried something extraordinary. They begged him because they sensed the glory as Jesus was quoting the scriptures to them. It was hard for them to put it into words, but they knew that they wanted more of Jesus. They were hanging out with him, and they knew there was spirit to spirit. There was a recognition after they urged him strongly. They begged him. He agreed to stay. Ladies and gentlemen, beggars can be choosers. He is God and we are not. He is king and we are his subjects. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus will walk with us on our Emmaus road, but will move on unless we ask him to stay. How many here have had or have ever, or even if you are today on the road of Emmaus in your life, all you need to do is tell Jesus, urge him strongly. See, he's making off as if he's going to go by, but don't be fooled. It's your choice. You have to put a demand and say and urge him, stay, don't go. <coughs> I remember one day many years ago, I was in South Africa, and I was translating for this great man of God who had an incredible experience with, with God. And, you know, he, he was so touched, and he, he was just so, he had an incredible experience. And I said, I, I was translating him from a, a Spanish to English over there, and I said, I said, I, you know, I'm kind of crazy sometimes. I said, God, if you did that for him, what, what can, if you visited him, why can't you visit me? So, you know, I, I just, I was in that afternoon with all the jet lag, you know, from a different time zone and all that, and having translated and preached so much. Uh, Miss Yvonne and with this, this man's wife went out to get some things from, a, from the store, and I stayed in the room, and I, there was like a, like a love seat right there, in the room and I said I said Jesus that's your chair I'm here I I want you to visit me today you know those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled you have to ask him ask and you will receive seek and you shall find knock and it will be open to you and all of a sudden I fall into this deep deep sleep and I'm I'm there and I'm, I'm I'm just sleeping when I when I wake up and I know when I'm awake, okay? I know when I'm awake. But all of a sudden, I, I'm, I'm on my side there, and this humongous, this huge hand was over my head. And I knew it was the hand of the Lord. And I didn't dare open my eyes. I said, I said Lord, I know it's you. Please don't go away. Please don't go away. And all of a sudden, I felt I was falling back to sleep. I said, I don't want to fall asleep. I don't want to fall asleep. I want this moment to last forever. I want, you know, ladies and gentlemen, when you ask him, when you ask him, he will reveal himself to your heart. He will reveal himself. See, on the road of our disappointments, if you ask him, if you urge him, if you beg him, he's making, he's, he's making do as if he were going on, but he really wants to join you, but you got to open the door. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you open the door, I will come in. See, the handle of the door is on your side, on the inside. And only you can open up that door and invite him in, and he will sit with you and sup with you and you with him. Amen. 
James chapter 4 says, come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Jesus comes to places where he's celebrated, not simply tolerated. That's why in our worship services, we worship till we break through. Because we ask God, we don't want to do church as normal. We want to have an encounter. We want to have a transformation. We, we, I hate the litany. No more litany. No more. This is what we do. What does the Holy Spirit want? What does God want? Because it's a living relationship. How can we categorize and put into a program? How can we legislate what the Holy Spirit is going to do? God, you only have three minutes to do. We're going to worship you for 14 and a half minutes, and that's it. Imagine if you did that with your spouse. You get slapped upside the head. I'm just saying. Luke chapter 24, verse 30, when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? See, they begged Jesus to stay. Then the time came for the breaking of the bread. Jesus took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and began to give it to them. Up to this point, the identity of Jesus was hidden from them. They walked, talked with him. They even urged him to stay. But then the breaking of the bread took place. Jesus took the bread and gave thanks and broke it. This taking, giving thanks, and breaking of the bread was unique to Jesus. John chapter 6, then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Matthew chapter 14, bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people. This is the feeding of the 5,000. Bring the people to sit down on the grass, taking five loaves and two fish. And looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. Right? The feeding of the 5,000. And in Matthew chapter 26, while they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. The identity of Jesus was revealed to them when, he, when the bread of life took the bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them. That is the very moment that they recognized them. Again, Luke chapter 24. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. And their eyes were open. They recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us when he talked with us on the road and opened the scripture to us? The eyes of the disciples in Emmaus were open. And they recognize their Savior and Messiah, the breaking of the bread. Breaking bread together is a sign of covenant. Breaking bread together is a sign of covenant. There was a way that Jesus broke bread that was unequal to anyone else. Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also passed unto you, the Lord Jesus on the right hand. He was partake, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. See, Jesus, in other words, Jesus served communion to those disciples right then and there in Emmaus. Jesus gave, gave us a way that we may have communion with him. This is why he commanded us to do this regularly. The reason we're commanded to do communion regularly is be because if we don't, we tend to forget. We may find ourselves again on the road to Emmaus of our lives. So do this as often as you meet in remembrance of me. See, as human beings, there, there are things that cause us that trigger our memory. And it's the breaking of the bread. Whenever we partake of communion, it triggers our memories because, frankly, we rather not think about the sacrifice that Jesus underwent so that we could be saved, that so that we could be healed. See, because it was so awful and so horrific that we tend to, to wipe it away. And then we tend to really almost unconsciously forget it. But this breaking of the bread brings it back. Because when we understand and when we dwell on it, we become more grateful that it should have been us on that cross and not him. Communion is powerful. It is a memory trigger. We practice communion in remembrance of him. 
as soon as they recognized him, he disappeared from their sight. May I have the worship team, please? So he was walking and talking with them, and they did not recognize him. He broke bread with them, and they instantly recognized him. At that moment, he disappeared from their sight, but left with them the memory of the breaking of the bread. Luke chapter 24, they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us and the, on the road, and he opened the scriptures to us? See, before Jesus broke the natural bread, bread he walked, talked, and broke the uh, he walked and talked and broke the bread of the word of God with them. Jesus himself said, "Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God." Explaining the scriptures caused the hearts of the disciples to burn. It caused something unusual, supernatural. They may not have known exactly who was giving them the word, but they knew that they wanted more. When you eat of the word. Your spirit man gets nourished. Man shall not live by bread alone. As I see places in the world that have famine, they'll, they'll go through anything just to get a bite of food, right? Of bread. Are we that desperate, famished for the word of God? Or do we snub at it? Because we'd rather read all the books than read the word. These disciples knew that they needed more. This is the reason they urged him, strongly urged him to stay. They begged him. May this Easter, Easter day remind us that Jesus, our Lord, is risen. He's not in the tomb anymore. As a matter of fact, I've been to Jerusalem. I've been to the tomb, but you know what? It's still empty. <laughs> Zero, not us, nothing. He's not there. He was there, but he's now risen. Out of all the religions in the world and all the so-called deities, only one, only one, only one came back to life. Never saw decay, came back to life. Not only did he come back, but he was raised up. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave. Not only rose him up, but seated him in heavenly places at the right hand of the Father. That same power, that same spirit dwells in us. That devil defeated, death defeating power dwells in us. Let me tell you. You're walking around with a, with a boatload of power within you. Some of us have chosen not to exercise it. Some of us don't even know how to access it, but it is there. It is there. It is there. It is there. How do you manifest the power of God in your life? Obey his word. Obey his word. Submit to the king. How do you activate it? Oh, there's a password, and it's called the name of Jesus. It's called the name of Jesus. Why do you think demons tremble? Why do you think the atmosphere changes when we mention that name? Because there is power. There is only one name given to men by which we must be saved. And his name is Jesus. I want us to stand to our feet. To those under the sound of my voice who find themselves on an Emmaus Road experience, if your hopes and dreams have been shattered by life, by people or religion, remember that Jesus has joined you during this very service. He has been speaking to you through the scriptures, through the worship service. You have felt something different. You couldn't put your finger on it, but you felt something different in your life. Let me submit to you, that is the presence of Jesus that cannot be manufactured, that can only come when you beg him to stay. And my prayer as the pastor of this house, I don't want Jesus to pass us by. I want him to stay. I want this place to be a place of permanent habitation of the glory. I don't want religion. I don't want to talk about it, but he's just not in the room. I want him to be here because one encounter with Jesus, not with pastor, not with programs, but with Jesus. 
You need an encounter. You don't need more religion. You don't need more rules of do's and don'ts. You need Jesus. Some of you have experienced the presence of Jesus. He has revealed himself through the sharing of these scriptures. Know this. He's for you. He's not against you. He's not looking to remind you of your sin. He's here to forgive your sins. He loves you. He's not afraid of your disappointments. Even when you have, you have turned on him. Because what, what started the passion of Christ? One of his own betrayed him. One of his own betrayed him. The level of betrayal is directly proportional to the level of relationship. In other words, somebody who's not really connected to you can betray you. It doesn't mean that much. But when someone who's very close to you turns on you, oh my God, the pain. <laughs> so Judas, one of his own, one of the 12, one of the ones he hung around. But how did Judas begin all this? He started pilfering, taking a few pennies from the from the offering, see the love of money, the love of money. And the love of money, he began, he trained himself over time to resist the convicting power of Christ. He could have just spilled the beans and said, you know what, I did wrong, forgive me. But no, he kept it and he bottled it up and he kept it in darkness and the darkness within him grew. And he grew to such a point when they offer him 30 pieces of silver, 30 measly pieces of silver to turn the one that is the pearl of great price, to someone who has no price. He turned him in. Let me tell you something. How many times have we not on the road to Emmaus, we have literally betrayed him, we have, we have walked away, but he's here today telling you, if you will open up your heart, I'm going to heal you. I'm going to, I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to save you. You're not here accidentally. Jesus brought you to this place today. And I close with this scripture out of the book of Matthew chapter 11. To those who have dealt, because I sense today that God wants to hear the brokenhearted. God wants to heal those. You know, I heard this the other day, but I love it. You know, I hear so often about church hurt, right? Why don't I hear supermarket hurt? Because if they mistreat you in one supermarket, you go to the other. Why don't I hear movie hurt? Because if you get mistreated in one, you go to the next one. But how come people say it's church hurt and then they refuse to go to any church? How is that big? How could that be? Because it's really an excuse. It's really an excuse, ladies and gentlemen. Church hurt doesn't cut it. I'm sorry. You're just mad, plumb angry with God. And you might as well come clean. See, smile. Jesus loves you. I'm calling out some things. It's not the church. It's not the body of Christ. Christ's fault that you were hurt. It was even inside the church. There are some mean people. And there are also some hypocrites. But you know what? You go shopping with hypocrites. You work with hypocrites. Going to church with them, no big deal. But you know, the Lord is calling you from the Emmaus Road experience and turn your hearts back towards him. Let's close our eyes right now. If you're here in this place and you know that you need healing in your heart, and your heart has been burning within you. And you know that you know that you know that he's speaking to you. He's been speaking to you from the moment you walked into this place. And if that's you and you want to give it up, you want to surrender. You want to say, you know what, God, I have blown it. I've messed up and I'm not where I need to be. I've been walking one step after another away from the place that you call me. He's calling you back to his own. If that's you, it, it, I'm not going to put you on the spot, but raise your hand quickly and say, Pastor David, that'll be me. How many honest people we have here today? I see your hand. I see your hand. Anybody else? 
If you're here today, you want to get your life right with God. You know, there's a hell to be shut and there's a heaven to be gained. Come back to him. Come back to him. Come back to Jesus. Does everyone pray with me? Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I give you my life. I give you my heart. I give you my soul. All that I am, all that I have, I give it to you. Have mercy upon me. Wash me with your blood. Write my name down in the Lamb's book of life. In Jesus' name. And I declare as you have believed in your heart and confess with your mouth that he is Lord. You are saved in the name of Jesus. I declare tangible, measurable changes. This resurrection day, the empty tomb speaks, still speaks. There's still that empty tomb in Jerusalem. And it will remain empty for eternity because he ain't there. He's seated at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Oh, I know I need to finish, but we're seated with Christ in heavenly places. Get off the Emmaus Road and get your seat, but you got to go higher. 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 You got to forgive. Why? Because if you don't, if you don't forgive, you're not going to be forgiven. Let me ask you something. Is the people that done you wrong worth you going to hell? Absolutely not. So I'm going to forgive them. I'm going to forgive them because forgiveness has everything to do with me and nothing to do with them. It frees me from the bondage. It frees me from, from going to hell. Hallelujah. So I'm going to forgive. It doesn't make what they did to you okay. It simply frees you up. We forget because we have been forgiven. Talk about taking the power back. You're not a victim anymore. You're not a victim anymore. You are not the victim anymore. You are a victor. You have victory. You have been raised with Christ Jesus. The same power that rose Christ Jesus from the grave dwells in you. And he will quicken your mortal body. He will quicken your mortal body. Raise your hands. I declare resurrection power. Church, pray, pray.